The Tap, a TEDx Athens podcast powered by iStorm, Apple premium reseller. Louis, Dina, and I would like to welcome you to our podcast. We are very excited. Uh, the whole week we are excited. We were really and stressed be- and excited. Yes. <laughs> And uh, on behalf of the entire TEDx Athens team, and we are a lot of people, we would like to thank you for this uh, honor. Oh, thank you for letting me join you. And just like you showed us right now, we are you're live from Sausalito, California. Being from Sacramento, I really miss the Bay Area, so I'm really jealous you're there, and we're all jealous you're there. <laughs> oh, well, um, I'm jealous you're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we dive into your work, and go deeper into everything that you're doing right now, we would like to ask you, how are you during this pandemic? How has 2020 impacted you? And are there any insights that you'd like to share? Oh, boy. Um, Yeah, well, I mean, I I think the pandemic has actually been a, in some ways, I think it's been a really helpful to to the entire world to realize that we're all connected we're all together you know i think if you're at a certain amount of wealth if you're in a certain region you could always say well it's you know sad about them but i'm okay now we realize that we're we're all connected and that's one of the messages we've been trying to do with our films for you know for the past 15 years is to show that there's a connection to everything you can't um you know, you you can't have it. Everything that we do has an impact, and this is, you know, one thing that we're trying to do with a, another. We can talk about it later, but with our with a couple of films that we're working on is to show the relationship with the pandemic, the current pandemic, to animals. You know, are the it's it's the animal production for for human consumption is responsible for seventy five percent of these zoonotic diseases. You know, like you know, the Spanish flu, the swine flu, the bird flu, the coronavirus. You know, back in oh god, you know, when we did a, a film called Racing Extinction, we went to Guangzhou, where the first uh, SARS epidemic came out. And and you know, there's a the the scene of that movie where we're going through the markets. These are wildlife markets. It's you know, from a Westerner's point of view, it's well, any point of view really is pretty horrendous. They have animals from you know, they're selling dogs, cats. Pigs, bats, rats—you know everything you can imagine under the sun is for sale there. And of course, that's what gets us into trouble when we take an animal out of the wild, like a bat, and consume it. Uh, you're bringing with it a whole host of what they call, um, you know, these zoonotic diseases, where they can have a chance to spill over the virus to other animals that are in the market because you have them bleeding and defecating and urinating all to, and all on top of each other. And I've seen this, and it's 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 profoundly uh, just just from a humanitarian standpoint, it's it's gut wrenching. But now we see the ramifications of that. You know, we can we can get right into this. You know, there's a there's something in Chinese culture. Now, this is not Chinese bashing, as you'll see, as you know, in another minute. There's something in Chinese culture called zhenbu, and it's essentially it means that when you eat an animal, you're taking from it the spirit of that animal or the qualities that that animal has. So the reason that bats are in the market in in Wuhan or other places like that is because there's a belief in Chinese culture that you're getting the qualities of that animal. So a bat is being consumed or the bat feces. You can Google it. They're actually eat bat shit. You right here in California, you can go to a Chinese uh, traditional market, you know, for, for medicine and buy bat dung, bat poop, and you consume it like in a tea and it could be full of the virus. I've actually done it myself. I've actually not eaten Mm. it, but I've actually bought it just to prove that it can be done. So right, right right here in the Bay area, San Francisco, you can go, you can have you can because there's this bat shit belief that if you Literally. eat the quali- <laughs> eat the quality of that animal so the, so the reason that the that bats are in the markets in China is because there's a belief that if a, a human eats them or their bat poop it's going to give you the qualities of a bat so you can see at night or if you have glycoma so animals have bats have this extraordinary vision so there's a belief that you'll have that oh, this, that sounds crazy right but, I mean, if you look at our work, there's also this 
I think, a batshit belief that we need to eat any animal to be strong and healthy. You know, the, uh, you know, the, like I said, the, the eating of animals across the board has, you know, the, the bird flu that was, you know, caused by the Spanish flu in the, you know, the early part of the last century, uh, uh, you know, a million people died from a swine flu just, a, you know, a decade back. I mean, the list is long, and this yeah. one is just a, a little bit more frightening. It's been a little bit more per, uh, pervasive, but you know, this, these these uh, pandemics are not unusual. And, and I've been talking to epidemiologists, and they said this is just the beginning. You know, mm. they've been. You know, <laughs> our President Trump said nobody could see this coming, and I, so it's like, well. Everybody I've been talking to, you know, the epidemic, they could see it coming. They're they're out there right now, tamping down these diseases that are coming out of the slaughterhouses or the so so called CAFOs, the confined feeding operations. Mm. They're all they're you know all around. I'm sure they're all over Greece. They're all over Europe. They're certainly all over America. And these are places and I've been to them. They're where you can find tens of thousands of like birds, like you know turkeys or ducks or chickens, chickens. In, in, in one in one big long room and you go into these rooms and the smell is like it, it's overwhelming the smell of the, the ammonia from the urine and these animals live like that and they have to give them you know all sorts of uh you know drugs to keep them from you know having a, this mass killing and, and occasionally one gets away you know you have well and one reason that they're in these confined feeding operations is they you know they can't be in the wild because if they go out to like say a pond they're going to mix with ducks and ducks carry the flus the bird flus and so you have this this awful um catch 22 situation where we think we need animals to eat and if we raise them in a humane way it's not economic and then when you do raise them the way that you know it becomes industrial and cost effective you create these diseases it's just it's just math. It's just physics. And you can see that what we're seeing now, like with the virus, where it just keeps on mutating and spreading, that, yeah. you know, this is, this, is, this is the nature of nature, is that it just tries to live like the rest of us, except that you have something that's detrimental to human existence or animal uh, welfare. It starts to impact everybody. And so that's, you know, I guess to bring it around to that, what you were just talking so about, you, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's been good because we're now, it, 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 we don't sound so crazy anymore because, you know, we could talk about the eventuality where, you know, climate change is going to affect us or, the, you know, there could be a, a pandemic that'll affect everybody. And, and that's, you sound like a crazy person until it actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we exploit nature, we farm animals, we pollute the oceans. We have lost our connection with planet Earth. Is it possible to gain it back before it's too late, you think? I think so. I mean, and, and one thing that gives me hope is, is film. You know, film is the most powerful weapon in the world that we have for social change. You know, when we first did The Cove, uh, The Cove, if, you know, a lot of people probably haven't seen it, The Cove uh, was the first documentary that we did. It was a film about, on the surface, it looks like it's about dolphin hunting. In, in Japan, at the time, they were killing about 23,000 dolphins and porpoises every year for human consumption. Even though dolphins have some of the highest levels of mercury, well, they do have the highest level of mercury of any animal in the world. They're even higher than, you know, the, the highest fish. Um, but in, in Japan, they're allowed to sell them because they're not fish. There's really strict rules on how much mercury can be in a, in a fish. But, of course, a dolphin and a porpoise is not a fish. It's a mammal. Right. So it squeaks by. A dolphin can have anywhere from five to 5,000 times more mercury than allowed by Japanese law if it was a fish. But um, it's not. So, But when we did that film, like I said, 23,000 dolphins and porpoises uh, killed every year in Japan for human consumption. But most of them, a lot of them being given away to school children for school lunch programs, where in Japan you have to eat everything on the plate. So they were being force-fed poison. Now that's stopped because of the film that stopped. And I think last, one of the, like two years ago, they killed only 1,610, still a lot, but still like over a 93% drop in, in dolphin deaths because of the activism around that film. So films are powerful. And you know what we did, our second film, Racing Extinction, you know, that film is about species extinction, you know, trying to alert the world that there's something, a disaster going on right now, a human caused disaster called the Anthropocene, the age of man, where we're on track to lose, you know, some people say a million species by the end of 
uh, this century, or some people say half of all species by the end of the century. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. with this spike. By, and the, the, the biggest cause of that is the eating of animals for human consumption, this sort of crazy jinbu that we have in all over the world that we need to eat animals. And of course, you know what, you know, we, we did a film called Game Changers that we could also talk about, but it's a, you know, because the, the the, the, yes. that film's about plant-based super athletes. And we wanted to prove that, listen, you know, the, the, the one of the world's strongest men, Patrick Baboumian, carried more weight further than anybody in, in human history is plant-based. You know, Scott Jurek, the most accomplished ultra runner in the world, you know, runs and wins races over 100 miles. He ran 165 miles in a single day. I think the only person to beat him that ran more was a Greek. (laughs) Anyway, that's another that's another story. (laughs) Not surprising. (laughs) So, I mean, and we followed Scott Jurek when he was running uh, the Appalachian Trail. It's about a 2200 mile trail in America. Basically goes from, you know, the north, the northeast of America to the you know, the Southeast. And he did it in 46 days. It was a world record at the time. It was uh, 46 days. And he did it, it as was, was like two marathons a day with over 11,000 feet of, uh, you know, elevation gain and descent every day. So it's almost going up two miles and down two miles every day and um, doing two marathons a day on a plant-based diet. Mm-hmm. So one of the strongest guys in the world, plant-based, one of the most uh, enduring athletes, uh, Scott Jurek, on a plant-based diet and of course there's a scene in the in the uh the game changes where you know guys are thinking well if i really want to you know you know be virile have a lot of sex i need to be eating meat and we proved well not proved but we did an experiment where we <laughs> we, we showed there's this device that you can put on a on a the male genitalia and it's basically measures nocturnal erections how many basically hard-ons a guy can have right. during the night and and the size and duration of those erections and there it, the, uh, this device was designed it's called a rigid scan it was designed for men that have uh, erectile dysfunction and which is really a, a big problem in america and it's really connected to your heart this is one of the smallest arteries in your body in a man's body goes to the the male penis and so they they would measure uh it's basically a device where you have a uh you have a a ring that goes around the base of a man's penis and one at the head and it measures the circumference and the zoka measure like i said the duration of, of an erection how hard it is and they could determine if a man's uh erectile dysfunction is related to psychology his you know his is it or is it physical and the, that's really important because at night a man will have about six to seven nocturnal erections that are just wow. it's not connected to wet dreams it's not it's not connected to sexuality it's just the body telling uh you know the brain that you need to put blood into a very important organ so what we did was we took uh collegiate students and we gave them a a plant-based meal before they went off to bed and we put this device on well they put this device on them it's a (laughs) it's a the rigid scan is basically a computer that that attaches to your leg and that these two rings i said that go to the, the genitalia and what we found was that on average, so though within the following evening we gave them a meat based meal and did a and did the test. And on average, their erections of a plant based meal were three hundred and fifty for three hundred fifty percent longer duration erection and about ten point four percent harder erection. So this myth that we have, this Zenbu <laughs> crazy batshit belief that we need to have animals to to be strong have endurance and have virility is just insane and it's getting us in this position where we have pandemics that are you know crushing the world's economy putting people out in the streets that you know that because of the economy and disrupting everything that we we like about life which is being together now we have to be socially mm-hmm. distanced everything we do it's it's so in a way yes the, the pandemic has been really good has, has been a really good lesson if we could teach the world to draw the connection you know through documentaries through podcasts like this or talks like this so that there's a relationship between what we're doing to the wild and what we're doing to ourselves this is a self-inflicted pandemic so I'm curious because I'm not vegan. Tina is. I am. And, yes. and I'm trying to examine my internal resistance to all this information. And I'm trying to understand myself. I know the connection, right? I'm aware of the problem. I'm aware of what's happening. And I'm starting to get into this phase where I'm trying to 
make that jump. And, you know, I, I, I'm trying to examine why am I resisting? What's happening? Because if that, you know, if I'm resisting that way, there's more people like me that are aware, they're making the connection. So what's going on here? I don't know if you have any insights on that. We've got a lot of insights. We've, we did a, um, a white, well, we didn't do, we, we, there was a white paper that was uh, written about this exact same problem because we, we've known for decades <clears throat> that a whole foods plant-based diet is, is healthier for human beings. We know that, you know, and people come at this issue from different aspects, you know, probably the most vocal on the issue are the, are the vegans who are doing it for animal rights, you know, that they, they're, they're compassionate. They're, they care about other species and, those are, are very vocal, but you know most people don't operate like that. The the data shows that about ninety three percent of the population doesn't care. They think because, like yourself, they believe that you, to be big and strong, have you know endurance, all these things that you have to have. It plus it's very it's cultural, it's emotional. Your mother was giving you animals. Your grandmother was giving you animals. You have a very strong emotional connection. I did a story back when I was a photographer. I did a story on. The sense of smell. Uh, I was one of the first photographers that National Geographic hired in over a decade. And what I learned about smell, what we think about when you taste something, when you think of taste, you think, oh, you put it in your mouth and that really tastes good. But it's really your nose. Mm -hmm. Your nose <laughs> is, uh, the, the, the olfactory bulb is at the base of your brain. It's hardwired onto your brain. And so it has a very strong emotional connection. If you hear, sorry, if you smell something, it instantly brings you back to, oh, your, your grandmother baking bread in the kitchen and those memories. Okay. Yes. So it has a very strong emotional attachment. So everything that you've been doing since you were a baby is connected to food. It's, it's uh, your, your heart, you know, like that olfactory bulb, like I said, is hardwired onto the brain. So you have to uh, start disassociating. Okay, so, so to, to your point, about seven percent of the population is willing to to hear these messages about animal rights, and they'll make a emotional decision based on that. And then they can't understand why, you know, the rest of the world doesn't see that because the rest of the world isn't as connected to the empathy of other creatures. And then a, a slightly about the same amount of people, seven or eight percent, will will start to change for the environment. You know, those like my girlfriend, she's not a, you know, she's a vegan, not because she cares about animals. She does it because like, she knows it's better for the, for, for the environment okay. to get it when, to people that might be hearing this for the first time. It might be kind of strange. What, how could possibly the eating of animals affect the environment? Well, it's the, 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 the raising of animals for human consumption is the biggest cause of species extinction. Like when we're talking about losing half the species on the planet by the end of the century, we're talking about because we're raising animals, we're going into the wild and we're having to mow down you know, rainforests and, and, uh, pasture, not pasture land, but like meadows and f to raise food for animals that we're in turn going to eat. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest raising of animals is the biggest cause of water pollution. The biggest cause of, uh, one of, one of the biggest, uh, things that you can, well, 14 and a half percent of climate change is related to, you know, animal production. Uh, it's, you know, the list goes on. And you think, well, I'm just one person. How big a deal is that? Well, the average person eats about 10,000 animals in their lifetime in America, but it's slightly higher in the UK. It's about 10,400. Uh, it's about 401,000 gallons more of, of fresh water that need to be used if you're eating animals every year. Wow. About, ni about 9,000 square feet of wild area that needs to be turned over to raising pasture land. So, you know, it's the biggest cause of ocean dead zones. You know, there's 800 dead zones documented around the world and that's because of the runoffs from pasture from uh, fertilizers and uh, pesticides that are you know killing the reefs we've lost for, and, and again a lot of these things I'm talking about are there's multiple it's not just one thing but certainly animal production is the biggest you know it's the biggest driver of extinction by far uh, biggest driver of freshwater pollution you know and and about 85 percent of the diseases that we have, um, are caused by putting animals in your in your body. Uh, you can reverse heart disease, prostate cancer, early stage prostate cancer, early stage breast cancer, uh, and it, now it turns out that it might be able to reverse Alzheimer's. Um, mm -hmm. When we did the game changes, this is a doctor, Dr. Dean Ornish, about forty three years ago. He was working with a doctor who was the the um, really 
the the doctor who uh, popularized uh, bypass surgery. And mm-hmm. and Dean was an intern working for this doctor down in Texas, and um, they would snip off a you know a vein from a leg and put it in the heart. They would bypass the clog, right? That's why it's called bypass surgery. Mm-hmm. And then it's, you know a year later. Uh, you know, the same patient would come back and they do another bypass, you know, so they have like quadruple bypass surgeries. So, they're, they're, and he said they were just bypassing the problem. And, and at the time there were studies where they had, you know, you can give by, you know, <laughs> you know, giving the, you know, what they call the standard American diet with the acronym SAD to an animal, you, you can give it, heart, you can give it heart disease. And they were, they were uh, proving with animal studies that you could actually reverse heart disease on an animal. Uh, and Dean was like asking the very simple question, well, why can't you do that with people? And so, and back then it was, the thinking was that you had to, the only way to reverse heart disease was to give people a very powerful drug, you know, the statins or, uh, or do this bypass surgery and anything else was her- heretical. And so he did these, cl- you know, clinical trials and he proved that you could reverse heart disease with a, a you know, a, a Lifestyle medicine is called, and he didn't just use, you know, whole foods, plant based diet. He also used exercise and social support. We're social creatures. When it, when you're together, when you're doing something for other people, we can talk about that a little later. It, it's, it makes you feel good. It gives you joy. It gives you happiness. And there's really good evidence now that when you do things for others, it changes your blood. It extends your telomeres, the ends of your chromosomes, helps you live longer. You know the. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell won the Nobel Prize for a discovery of telomerase. It's the enzyme that uh, basically it's the the enzyme that is on the end cap of your DNA, and it's been likened to the shoelaces that you have. Like, and when the plastic end caps start to deteriorate, like telomerase or tel- uh, the telomeres, they they get shorter, so your life gets shorter, right. and um, those get extended with the whole foods plant based diet. They get repaired. And it does the opposite when you eat animals. There's a, you know, and there's the blue zones. You know, there's five known blue zones in the world, places where people live the longest without chronic disease. And, and Icaria, Icaria, Greece. Icaria, it's, yes. It's, yeah, it's, it's called the, you know, the island where people forget to die. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, and, there's, and they, go, they go to these, so there's five known blue zones in the world. And people are living, you know, on average 10 years longer than the rest of us and they're healthy there's one blue zone in america in loma linda it's about 70 miles east of la and about half the population is is vegetarian because they're the seventh day adventists Mm -hmm. and you know Mm -hmm. where you know in the bible in genesis where god is supposed to said uh let the fruit of thy trees be thy meat they take it literally Mm -hmm. and so in loma linda they have, uh, this is interesting, I call it the tale of two cities. You have Interstate 10 going from east to west mm. in America, right? And it's, it ends in Los Angeles, you know, on, on, the, on the west coast, but 70 miles east of it is Loma Linda. On the south side is Loma Linda. On the north side is San Bernardino. On one side of the highway, you have one of the healthiest populations like Icaria in the world, in Loma Linda. Across the, just across the road, you know, uh, you know, probably about 40 steps away is San Bernardino, and you have one of the unhealthiest populations in the state of California. What's the difference? Well, you have this religious cult. <laughs> I don't want to say cult. These, these people that, you know, that are taking the, the Bible very literally, and they're healthy. And now what's the difference? In San Bernardino, if you want to get fast food, you have to go to San, San Bernardino. They don't have it in Loma Linda. They have a, their equivalent of, you know, of Whole Foods, the, the big grocery store, the store there in Loma Linda. They don't sell meat. You can't Whole get Foods, it there. They don't sell meat. No, it's it's there. It's called the Loma Linda Market. Oh, okay. it's, it's 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 like a Whole Foods. I don't know what they call cool, it. I can't use it because we're, we're talking to hopefully an international audience. But it's a big grocery store. The biggest grocery store in town doesn't sell meat. They sell milk, but it's like plant-based milk, you know, and the, the cow's milk is on a on another uh, cooler at the bottom, you know, so it's not very popular. Now, uh, some when I was doing the, the Game Changers, you know, the film about uh, plant-based d- diets, uh, we met Dean Ornish. I met Dean Ornish, who actually is right down the hill from me here in Sausalito. And this is before I was, I was living here. And he said, uh, he, he told me that half his family died from Alzheimer's. And he, he might have the Alzheimer's gene himself. And now he's going to see if he could reverse Alzheimer's. You know, remember, he did it with heart disease, 
Yes. Di- early stage yeah. diabetes yeah, and early yeah. stage prostate cancer. And now he's going to try to do it with Alzheimer's. And I thought that's incredible. So I've been following him for the last year and a half as he has these cohorts coming through his office and he's trying to re- reverse Alzheimer's. And it looks, I mean, I hope I'm not talking out of turn, but it looks, you know, this, this, the study isn't done by a long shot. There's only been about oh, 15 people that have gone through the first cohorts, mm-hmm. but uh, but they're getting really strong results. Like there's been hundreds of billions of dollars that have been spent by drug companies and governments to try to reverse Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is on track to become one of the most deadly diseases going through the population. Going to, you know, another 10, 15 years, it's going to overtake heart disease as our primary killer chronic of chronic disease. And Alzheimer's, if people don't know, is one of the most insidious diseases you can have. A heart disease is thankfully, you know, if it can kill you, but uh, with Alzheimer's, you're slowly losing your brain. You're solely yeah. what it means to be hu- human. And about one out of three people are going to be affected by Alzheimer's. So you'll, you'll have it yourself. Your mate's going to have it. Or you'll be taking care of parents that have it. So to, to, to Dean, this was really important because, you know, his half his family died for it. And he might have the gene. We tested him for the gene. I did the, uh, you know, a DNA a DNA test on him, and and he does have the gene. He doesn't have Alzheimer's, but he has the gene. So reversing is really, you know, important to him. Well, it turns out that um, in the first cohorts, about sixty eight percent of early stage Alzheimer's p- patients are getting better on cognitive tests. So it's it's he's doing what no drug has been shown to do, and wow. it, that's get slightly, slightly get better. Now I went to Loma Linda, and I was photographing two people that open up a Alzheimer's and brain health clinic at the Loma Linda uh, hospital there. And they they opened up the doors and nobody came. They had to go to San Bernardino and <laughs> recruiting areas to get people because remember the whole town is like most, not the whole town, most of the town is, is, is plant-based. Right. And so they've had 5,000, about 5,000 patients come through there. Only 13 of them are vegetarian in a town where about you know 40% of the population is vegan. So it just shows you that if you want it, and you go to the parks and you see like 80 and 90 year olds, like, you know, exercising, you go to the gym, uh, the local gym there, there's 300 people that are, uh, you know, that have memberships that are 80 years and older. And they're not just like, you know, doing little, you know, tiny weights and stuff. They're like one guy was in his seventies and he's, you know, he's on a, on the parallel bars swinging around like an athlete. You, you go you go to you go to their church and you see ninety year olds skipping down the sidewalk to church <laughs> holding hands like they're like out of kindergarten. So- I mean it, <laughs> so I mean you know, we, we did the game changes with the idea that, okay, to, you know, it's mainly for, a, I'd say, a younger audience to prove that, hey, listen, to have all these attributes that we hold dear, you know, strength, virility, endurance, that it's a myth. But, you know, for somebody like me, I'm I'm interested, I'm 63 years old, I'm interested in living long without, the, without chronic disease. So if you just look at the data, you know, 95% of the, the calories in the, the blue zones come from a whole foods plant-based diet. So yeah. to, to answer your question, mm-hmm. you know, it depends where people are coming co- are coming from. Like, you know, when I when I talk to people and I mention that you can reverse diabetes, you see somebody perk up and you realize that they're taking medication. You know, so you have to find people where they're at. You know, I, I want to reach more than 7% of the population. I, I do care about animal rights. I do care that we're, you know, I care about a lot of things. I care about people. I care about people near me living longer and healthier. You know, part, part of it's list. You know, I don't want to take care of, you know, my brothers and my sisters and my, my friends when they get when they get sick. And if I can tell them about the virtues of, you know, a whole foods plant based diet and being healthier and, you know, live by example, then it's a plus not just for them, but for me, too, because I, I get to be around them healthier. I don't want to go to, you know, a family reunion and talk about everybody's problems you know? <laughs> and, and what medication they're taking. And, yeah. yeah. Sorry about the game changers that I have watched, of course. Uh, there is a nice point there by Arnold Schwarzenegger that it points out that that it's plant-based uh, since uh, some years. I don't know how many. But it points out that eating meat is not about mascu- uh, being masculine. It's about marketing. And this is a very interesting point. Showing us, like San Bernardito, that we have turned it all wrong. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, it's 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 marketing, and you've been marketed to. You know, it's like you've you know you have yes. you, you've even marketed to by our society, been marketed to by the marketers. You know, there's a lot of people that stand to gain, and you know, financially, you know, there's a whole horrible industry. You know, the that that's complicit in this, and I don't say think it's people knowingly, you know, feeding us unhealthy items i think it's as part of the dogma and listen i mean okay i know it sounds crazy that you know that what i'm a lot of people listening to this program probably think okay that's nuts you know that that you know animals could be happy be having that effect on the environment on how human health well let me just tell you like i've been involved in on on movements for a fairly long time um you know, back when I did my first story for National, the first story I did for National Geographic was on garbage and recycling. And back then, and this is 1980, that I proposed the story to National Geographic. There's only one, there's only one mandatory recycling program in all of America. We did that story, became a cover story, about 35 pictures on the inside, and recycling started to take off. Not just because of that article, but because it became part of this this groundswell. Now we have. You know, recycling in my kitchen. There's recycling at the hotels. There's recycling everywhere. There's issues with recycling. I'm not saying it's a panacea, but that that was nuts back then to think that people are going to be sorting out their garbage. But we're doing it. Okay. When um, I had one of the first electric cars in Colorado, it was a, t- a 2002 Toyota Rav, fully electric. Uh, I solar. I, I powered it with 120 solar panels on my roof. And I was nuts. I was a, like, all my neighbors were like, "What the hell you got on your roof? Like, what, what that car? What's what's that's a strange looking car? What's 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 up with that?" <laughs> and and I said, "This is amazing." Listen, I, I had a a thousand dollar electric bill because I was running you know, my organization, the o- Oceanic Preservation Society, out of the backyard in my studio. In my house is a thousand dollars a month for for my electric bill. I had you know a dozen people working there, and uh, once I put the solar panels on. The, the the electric bills went away and I got electric checks. And so when I went to the, the mailbox, because I, I got paid for overconsumption, you know, I was producing more electricity than I was using. <laughs> and so the, I would get these, you know, instead of this kind of dread, like, oh, is it going to be, you know, $1,200 this month or 600 whatever, uh, I, I'd be like, you know, jumping, you know, you're jumping up and down when you see the electric check come because it's like, oh, look, it's $600. We had a, must have had a lot of sun. And I, and I thought I was like, you know, first of all, I was on the, the vanguard of this movement, and everybody around me was crazy. You know, when you hop into an electric car, you you know, listen, you don't know what the excitement is about unless you hop into an electric car, because all of a sudden it's like you get put back in the seat. You know, you feel that um, that that torque. You know, so it's like a it can be like an amusement park ride, and and when you're when you never have to go to a gas station again <laughs> and pump your own and, gas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I, I mean, pump, I, was, I was you know my my license plate said V U S. You know, it's just, it's just it's for vehicle SUV. using sun. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just for vehicles using sun. It's the opposite of an SUV, and and so anyway, I was a lunatic for you know until. You know, several years later, it two, uh, one one thing we did in racing extinction is we took a Tesla and made it into a bond car, mm-hmm. and it, and what, what we had the first car in the world to have an electric alum, uh, electroluminescent paint job. We had this kind of a, if you see the film, it'll make a lot more sense. It's yeah, kind, yeah. We kind of used it as like a reverse camouflage because we'd show up in New York and we'd project. There was a, tw- a twenty thousand lumen projector that came out of the back of a robotic arm, and we could project images of carbon dioxide that which we could see because we had a FLIR camera a forward-looking infrared camera that came out of the front the, you know where the engine would normally be on an on a ice vehicle a neutral combustion engine car we'd have a FLIR camera so you could see carbon dioxide or methane and um we could project those images on skyscrapers and then we could you know we'd have this the car start to glow and people would like call the cops and say oh we got this, <laughs> this crazy car and they try to describe it they sound like a lunatic we turn off the electroluminescent paint job we zip off into the night and we look like a normal car and we had disappearing license plates we had this amazing car so we took a tesla s and now elon uh musk we went to go visit him because we wanted to go get one of the first you know uh, model uh s's to come out and Back then, uh, when we interviewed him, I, I think it must have been like October, I wrote him and he said, yeah, come on, come on down. And then he wrote back a little while later and said, hey, can we put this off until next quarter? I could go bankrupt. Mm. You know, he had, to, he had to hit his numbers. Otherwise, he thought, you know, the, the, he could 
you know, could go under. Yeah. Now, that, that was 2012. <laughs> the whole point is, is to talk about movements and how craziness it becomes mainstream is that now Elon Musk is the, the richest man in the world, you know, toggles between, you know, Jeff Bezos and him yes. between, you know, <laughs> but that's not what motivates Elon. He's doing it because he wants to save the world. He knows that we need to, to motivate the rest of the planet uh, to get onto electrification, otherwise we're never going to solve the carbon dioxide problem, the greenhouse gas problem. Now that sounds insane back in 2012, and now, you know, last week General Motors, you know, one of the biggest car companies in America before Tesla, just announced that that all their cars are going to become electric. He's inspired the entire you know automotive market to go electric. Now, what the reason I'm telling you this is because. The same thing's going to happen with the plant-based diet. Once people start to understand the virtues, the the win-win-win it is across the environment for people, for animals, for, for planet, it's obvious, just like electric cars are obvious. It's like, you know, we're, you know I, I feel like the whole damn world is living in a fog, and our job is to light it up a little bit and lift that veil so they can start to see what's right before the people that, that understand these issues. You know, and you think, well, can films do that? Well, it's not just films. It's like, you know, we do projection events. You know, back when we were doing, you know, there's, there's some really good data that shows to change the world, to change the world, you don't need 51% of the planet. You just need 10% of the planet. Mm -hmm. There's a there's an article uh, about the science of social change, and they showed that it's not 7% or 6%, it's 10%. And I called up the lead author, and he sent me, back then you had to, you know, you had to buy that paper. So I called up the, the you know, the, the lead author. I said, can you send it to me? And he sent it to me. And there's like three pages of math, a lot of algorithms. And math was not my favorite subject. <laughs> and I called him back and said, can you explain it to me in lay language? Can you, you know, just tell me like a, like a school child, why the science is, why, why 10% is the 10, number. Not the seven or 15. Yes. Yeah. And he said, well, it's like, if you're trying to make steam, you'll never be able to do it. The water, you know, the water, it'll just be like warm water until you get to the boiling point, 100 degrees centigrade, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And he said, 10% of the population, 100% committed to an idea is the tipping point for social change. It's the boiling point. And so now when you're, you're looking at things like, you know, when the, the plant-based movement is stuck at 7% because it's mostly vegans that are worried about animal rights, well, we, we just have to, you know, convert a small percentage of those people from the, the environmental movement. And then something interesting happened. Then, then it's unstoppable. The water keeps on boiling and it just, it, it, it becomes, you know, this boiling pot and, until it's mainstream. And that's what's happening with electric cars. That's what's going to happen with the plant-based movement. And people are seeing it. You're starting to see, you know, McDonald's and Burger King and, you know, the Chipotle. I don't know what there is in, in, in Greece, but there's like the fast food restaurants are, are taking over and it's the hottest sector. It's the fastest growing sector of the of of food production right now. There's a friend of mine that um, uh, Josh Tetrick and Josh Bach, two, two guys that started a company called Just, and they just, uh, you know, they, they, they know that it's going to be difficult to get everybody to switch over from meat. So they, they found a better way to do it. They, they have what they call uh, cellular agriculture, or cultured meat. They actually manufacture it, and they they take a single cell of an animal, not, and not kill it, killing it. You can take the the cell from a feather of a jungle fowl, which is the original chicken that now we have, you know, we full full of all sorts of hormones and antibiotics. But they can they can basically incubate the cell this this uh, the cell the same way that you would make, you know yeast or you know anything that's fermented and they can scale it up and they're now just in december they're starting to sell um chicken meat that looks and tastes like chicken in singapore the first country to do it mm -hmm. so i mean you know i've i love animals i mean and I, I but i i don't have them anymore because i just start realizing like, well you have a cat you know, God, it's like I, you, know, you, 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 you want to say you want to say you know, consider myself as somebody that's on the, you know, uh, you know, working on animal rights, and then you have a cat that's <laughs> definitely a carnivore, and you're feeding it cows, chickens, and pigs and turkeys. It's like it feels really hip hypocritical. But I can imagine that if you were, you know, eating cellular meat, you're giving it cellular meat. It'd be, you know, 
be fine, right? Because it's because the, yes. no animal was killed to to, to keep your cat alive. <laughs> With your cat, yes. Yeah. But what what was your turning point on becoming a vegan? I remember something about a slaughterhouse. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it was. It was a. It, unfortunately, it was a slow change for me. But in um, in September of 1986, I was I was doing a story for Fortune magazine on the biggest independently owned cattle ranches in America. Yes. And so I was going all around the country and one uh, one farm or ranch was so big in Oklahoma they had their own slaughterhouse. They killed about 500 cows a day. And I'd never seen a slaughterhouse and there's a that expression that, you know, if slaughterhouses had glass glass walls, no animals would die yes. for humans to be fed. Um, and you, you know why too. But they when they had the, the cattle come into the into the, the slaughterhouse they, they don't want to be there they can smell the death and they're trying to get out but they're in a shoot where they they can't go right or left they can't turn around I remember this one animal they put a captive bolt to the brain it's like a pneumatic gun and it's, it's supposed to kill the animal instantly and the first thing that they do is they they hook up these chains to the animal hang it upside down and they rip off the hide and so these animals their their hides their, their skin is off and they're coming around it's like a it's like a uh, it's almost like a like automobile assembly plant, but this is a disassembly plant. You know, people, as it goes around, people are cutting off different parts of it. And I you know, remember the one, one guy, he was just cutting off the genitalia. And I go, that's, you know, garbage, right? He goes, no, yes. hot dogs. <laughs> but I remember this one cow that would, uh, on the on the turn, as they're starting to cut off pieces of it, this, this cow's hanging upside down, and I could see it looking at me. And its, its eyes were following me. They're looking into my eyes, and its head was turning as it went around the conveyor belt. And I realized it was still alive. Oh, and I horrific. thought, okay, I can't, I can't be part of this. So I, I told myself, I'm never going to eat animals that walk again. Because in my head, I was like, okay, I was leaving myself and out with fish. I became a mm. pescatarian. <laughs> And I, so I was, you know, I ate a lot of fish because I still believe, like most people, that you need you know, to be big and strong and healthy. You had to eat animals. So I was eating fish, and my son is still is a professional fisherman, and he would oh. send me hundreds of pounds of fish. And so I would have, literally, I'd have fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when we were doing The Cove, the first film about dolphin hunting in Japan, um, one of the things that we do in the in, towards the end of the movie is we take a hair sample from Hideki Morinuki, the deputy minister of fisheries mm -hmm. in Japan. And we wanted to measure this because in hair, you can, you can measure uh, mercury in people's blood two ways or two ways by blood or by hair. And uh, mercury is the most toxic non radioactive element in the world. It basically, um, it destroys your synapses and, you know, destroys your brain. It slowly erases what it means to be human. And when we got the results from Hideki Morinuki, um, well, we sent him off to the lab, and I thought, well, I've been eating a lot of fish too. I should get my my hair sample, you know, tested. So we sent his in, we sent mine in, and his the the scientist called me back and said, hey, your your friend here has, you know, really high levels. It's like eight times more, you know, than the than what's considered high, like baseline high. And I think, oh yeah, Hideki, that makes sense. You know, Japanese Minister of Fisheries. You know, he's got. What about mine? He says, yours are really bad. He says, those are yours. Those are forty-four times higher. Okay. Whoa. So, Whoa. so mine was worse than the Deputy Minister of Fisheries in Japan, and that put a shock through me because I thought, what am I going to eat? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show up and die. And um, when I, we, so this is, so this came out. Um, you know, I guess it was right right about the time we were editing the cove. Then we got, and I'm like, okay, I'm I'm like eating less fish, but I'm, I'm I don't know quite what to eat. And we're down uh, for the Academy Awards in Los Angeles, and I'm sitting across from this woman who's a vegan. I was like, this is the first vegan I've ever met. And I said, what do you eat? And she goes, everything else. <laughs> she said, That's all simple. protein. All protein originates in plants. You know, where do you think the animals get it from? And there's a line where Patrick Baboumian, you know, the, one of the world's strongest guys, goes to, you know, somebody asked him, said, like, how do you get as strong as an ox, you know, eating plants? And he says, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was a, yeah. Sorry. 
Let no, me say it. a little bit about uh, uh, around the, the, uh, the Cove that we have watched it with uh, Dina and I was literally crying at the end. I mean, too much blood, shocking. too much cruel- yeah. cruelty, yes. What, which, uh, apart from Mercury levels and the health uh, perspective, which were your emotions and your cruise emotions when you were there and witnessing live all this cruelty? And, of course, we would like to tell, you, uh, tell us about all these technical difficulties that we saw oh. <laughs> during yeah. the filming. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, that, that film, I, we were shooting, we started it shooting it in 2006. It became, uh, I think we released it in 2009, you know, into theaters. And it became, you know, just for the, the viewers that haven't seen it, it became the most award-winning documentary in history. It was the first film, the first documentary in history to sweep all the film guilds, you know, mm-hmm. best producer, editor, uh, writer, director. Um, you know, won, uh, I don't know, 75 awards plus from the um, Sundance to the Academy Award. I didn't know there were so many awards. I mean, I really, I, 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 and, and that's not why we did it. You know, you the, took the, them all. We, 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 did, we did the film so we could create some change, and that it was successful, wildly successful on, on both accounts. But the first night, now, remember, this is, you know, probably. No, I can't even remember. Like 2007, probably when we we first went to the Cove, and these were the first hard drive cameras ever made. Before yeah. this, all the cameras were with tape. So this is a hard drive mm-hmm. camera. There wasn't even a way to take the the bits, you know, the hard drives, and make and put them into a film back then. So at night, when we took our picture, or took our film, we would have to take the hard drives out, put a new one in, and then we would hide the hard drives and the air conditioning ducts in case the police mm-hmm. came. But the first night we, um, I remember it was a, it was a Saturday and the dolphin hunters had caught a pot of uh, pilot whales. And pilot whales are actually dolphins. They're very large dolphins. Like pilot whales is just a name. And um, we had been up for about 48 hours and the crew set the, you know, the, the, the cameras over in, into the cove and I went around to the other side, and I was in face paint, you know, black, you know, mm-hmm. camouflage paint, uh, camouflage clothes. Um, I had taped all the shiny bits of my camera, and I would scaled up this hill onto like a, a, a cliff edge. And it was at the tops of, the, of this trees in this forest overlooking the cove, into the cove. And Rick O'Berry, the guy who's our protagonist in the film, he's the he's the a dolphin trainer, you know, worked for Sea World in in Miami. And he, um, he captured and trained the five female dolphins that collectively played the part of Flipper for the popular television series. And he became, when he started to realize how sentient and intelligent they were, he started to have a, a change of heart. And then on the first Earth Day, he went and tried to release some of the dolphins that he had captured. You know, the, the film's a, it's a beautiful film. It's like a heartwarming film, and it's a gut-wrenching film. And it's... You know, it's, it's an adventure film for people to think, oh, I can't watch a film like that. Well, you're going to see something. Like, I, I met the guy who did Born Identity and he says, oh, your, your <laughs> film's better than mine. You know, he's, uh, the, uh, Rolling, Rolling Stone said, uh, it, it's a, he, they said, <laughs> they said the, uh, the, the Cove is like a Born Identity meets Flipper, something like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, the first line of the film is me saying, I just want to say we try to do the story legally. So what we did is we snuck into this, uh, this, the cove illegally, set these cameras, and my crew went back to sleep because we'd been up, like I said, for 48 hours. I went around to the, the cove. Now I'm hanging from a rope. And now Rick has said, you know, on, they caught the animals on a Saturday. It was about, in my mind, it was about, I don't know, maybe a dozen to 20 pilot whales, big animals. And um, he said they, they probably won't kill them on a Sunday. Uh, they'll probably wait till Monday because they don't work on on Sunday. So we thought, well, let's go let's go into the cove, see what it's like, set the cameras. If it doesn't work, we can sneak back in and get them the next day. So my crew went off to bed, and I'm hanging from this rope on this little it's like a little table size rock uh, on this you know overlooking the cove. But I had to be hanging from a rock so I wouldn't fall off this little cliff. And about five thirty in the morning. So to set this up a little bit, we we had a uh, the camera we we put 
cameras inside of rocks that were fake rocks that we um industrial light and magic which is george lucas's outfit they were make this is back before everything was cg you know computer graphics mm -hmm. we they had a um we had them make these fake ro these rocks that look like rocks from the cove and we <laughs> hid these first hard drive cameras ever made in there <laughs> and the batteries weren't long enough to last like mm -hmm. you know for the length of time that we needed so we had uh these special batteries so we could get like you know four and a half hours on it because we had we had four hours and 10 minutes of drive time so that we, we'd sneak in at 3.30 in the morning, press play, and then the, ca the cameras would be rolling in the dark with nobody there. Then when the stun started to rose, if something happened, hopefully we would catch it, you know, with that last light, with the last little glimpses of battery. And uh, so I'm now I'm across the cove looking in, and it's 5.30 in the morning on a Sunday when the dolphin hunters weren't supposed to be there, two boats start coming around the corner. Oops. And they have flashlights, and one gets off on the other side of the cove, and one gets off right below me, you know, and on my side of the cove. And they get out and start looking into the woods with flashlights, and I realize that they're looking for people like me. Mm. Wow. And so, and so, my heart's like d jumping out of my chest because the flashlight beams are going through. And then I didn't realize what had happened, but they they disappeared and they went up to the park above me. It's called Tsunami Park. It's a place where people of the town go if there's a tsunami because it's high and i and i hear a woman screaming it looks like she's being raped and i think what the fuck's going on sorry yeah, <laughs> and okay. uh and um i you know so i'm i'm, I'm there you know shaking on this ledge and they, they but you know before that you know i'm all alone in the cove and these these the pilot whales are swimming these all the the males and the females the big ones are swimming around the young ones they're like protective right Mm -hmm. The clothes pretty big, but they're just hanging out together, swimming in circles. And every time they come up for air, you hear this. Mm -hmm. We we have a lot of relationship, but the cove what it'll, t what it'll tell you is that we're we're very similar to dolphins. You know, they have they have actually have bigger brains than us. The pilot whale has a bigger brain than us. They, they have more they have more um, spindle neurons, which are associated with complex processing. Excuse me, complex emotions. And I'm thinking, oh my God, these poor creatures! If they're they're going to get killed, if not tomorrow, the next day. And then this woman screams, and then they round up these pilot whales using their boat motors to push them into the cove. They select a couple for the aquariums for the the, the captive dolphin trade, and then they slaughter the rest. And then, um, you know, it was it was a beautiful blue sky day just like it is today like you could you know as you saw earlier mm -hmm. and and the cove is silent you know the the motorboats go home and I, and I can't leave I'm in face paint I'm a I'm an illegally in a national park and I realize that in a, in a foreign land and if I get caught you know we go to jail they could keep it for 28 days we'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions of dollars of in lawyers fees trying to get out of jail so I realized I got to hang from this rope for 15 and a half hours mm -hmm. until it's dark oh enough God. for my crew to extract me oh my gosh. that was that was that was day one <laughs> 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 uh and and we actually you know we, we cut them in the movie we cut it to make it look like we went in uh just twice but we actually went in about seven times mm -hmm. and um you know it because we had to get you know different angles different shots and you know close-ups and all that and you know the the the, the film was wildly successful because it gets your heart rate up and it was scary and there's a lot of events that happen oh so the woman that was screaming we found out it was an, another activist in the park a bubby they but they oh. caught her and oh. you know like like weeks later we found out through rick O'Berry that uh they wanted to know if we would go to the police station and pick up her camera because <laughs> they stole her the, the police <laughs> confiscated her camera and at one point you know we, we like we did all these multiple trips to japan and uh the cops would be following us every night and they they stood they it wasn't like they were right behind us. They thought they were being sneaky, but we we <laughs> discovered that they were following us. So they were like a couple blocks behind us. So we 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 used that as a way to get past them. You know, like we we'd rent two vans that were identical. One that we'd park outside of town, and then with the car, like we'd let, we we took off at three thirty in the morning to do our our um, you know whatever we we're going to do in the night. The cops were behind us. You can't do anything if they're, they're there. So we would we would go around a corner all hop out of the car the driver of our car would keep on going the cops would follow that car then we'd hop in the other van and then go mm -hmm. back to the cove or do, do whatever we needed to do so there's all these kinds of ways that you use from you know the hollywood spy movies to like the born you know, identity born identity <laughs> yes <laughs>
So have you so, visited Japan since then? Mm. What's that? Have you visited uh, Japan since then? Uh, you know, I did once. Um, in 2010, they had an environmental film festival. And the, Ironically. And, Ironically, and the, that the, it's uh, an envito- environment uh, film festival. Yeah, and I, uh, the, the director, the, the director of the festival, the guest director, uh, he won the Academy Award recently. I'll think of his name, Alexandra. Yeah, he was the, 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 the guest director, and he said, if you don't show the cove, uh, I'm going to step down. It'll be an international incident. And so they, they allowed me to come back to Japan, even though there's a, arrest warrants out for me. There's three charges, uh, conspiracy to disrupt commerce, um, uh, trespassing, and photographing undercover police without their permission. So I think wow. I could get arrested if I come back. So I, I actually <laughs> went to Japan with my lawyer. We had a Japanese mm-hmm. lawyer waiting there in case mm-hmm. there was a trouble. And I literally, I, we got off the, the plane, and literally as soon as I got off the plane, not like in the, the terminal, on the jetway where you, you you know exit that little tube, there's like TV crews and journalists waiting for me to get off. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, this, I'm gonna, <laughs> this is wow. going to be scary. They wouldn't let me walk the green carpet at the <laughs> festival. But um, I saw at the at the screening of the cove. There's all the dolphin hunters there. The mayor of Taiji, and this is interesting. There's a uh, a gentleman who is the head of the uh, International Whaling Commission. He wrote a book. He's actually he he wrote a book on 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 whaling from the Japanese perspective, and it's called On Whaling, the book. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, he's probably the most one of the most vocal and respected, you know. Um, defenders of of whale eating culture and we had um night vision cameras in the theater and you know trained on the dolphin hunters and this guy who was the head of the iwc mm-hmm. uh, in japan and he you could see him looking at the when the, the scene comes on you know the scene that everybody talks about in the movie yes. he's looking at it and he just goes yeah. he covers his eyes and just sinks his his head and starts shaking it like he just realized that no matter, it's indefensible the way that they what they do at the cove. It's it's so dark and it's so ugly and it's so indefensible that he realized that, you know, the, I want to say that their life is over. But just just yesterday, uh, just yesterday, I just read that. Well, I, I think I just read it this morning. It was uh, that Japan is no longer going to support the whaling ships because it's, it costs too much money and there's no there's no. Um, there's, there's a reduced market for it. So, I, I mean, whaling is dying. And it's, and I think a lot of yeah. it has to do with the activism around, you know, not, not just our film, but in, in general. Become, like, again, it's like you become part of that voice of people calling for a different world. And, you know, I hope if anybody gets anything from this, you realize that, you know, change is, it, it's, it looks crazy. You know, electric cars and alternative energy, you know, plant-based diets, you know, eating whales. I mean, all the, all that becomes crazy until it's not. You know, change is possible, and you can, and and it, and it happens so quick sometimes that it's just. I mean, the news that's coming out now about electric cars and the, the industry how it's changing. I mean, that's you know that was ten years ago. I was talking to Elon about that, and it's just, it, it's not that long. And it's, these changes take about ten years. You know, the, all these massive changes. There's a uh, there's a futurist by the name of T- uh, T- Tony Saba, I think his name is, and I saw he, he talks about this, the science of, of change from a, a from a scientific perspective. He said he showed at this conference he showed us a, a picture of the uh, the 1900 Easter parade in New York, and this is a parade where everybody comes out in all the regalia and they they they, they go down Fifth, uh, Broadway in their vehicles, but in, in 1900 it was horses. So there's a, there's a picture taken from a, a roof uh, uh, on a building on Broadway looking down the street, and you see it's all horses except for one car. And then about 10 years later, 2013 Easter Parade, it's the opposite. It's like, <laughs> find the horse. There's like one, right. one horse. And so, and, and so like, you know, remember, like, in, you know, the, the iPhone came out in 2007, which meant that when we were texting, we had to punch the number two key six times on our on our flip phones to, to text a capital C. Yes. You know, <laughs> and now, now, Dina, like in 10 years, I hope you're going to be going, like, I can remember when I was eating meat. Oh, my God. Well, you that- know, to be honest, this conversation has really shifted some things in the sense that it's not so narrow focused that I have to, I can pick and choose 
which pain point I want to go with. Like you said, you know, you got to meet people where they're at. And it doesn't have to be, it's not that I don't care about animals, but being healthy makes, you know, much, a much deeper connection inside of me as opposed to, you know, not that I don't care about animals, but you know what I'm saying? Like that makes more sense. So I can connect with that. Whereas I, I was shutting down because I thought I was being flooded with all of this information that I almost like compassion fatigue. Like I just shut down because I did, I could not deal with it. You know, I didn't want to think about it. So, uh, it's really interesting though. Yeah. And, and yeah, maybe, you know, in, in, a year, I'll tell you, I'm not eating meat, you know, <laughs> hopefully won't have to wait 10 years. But I'm curious to, um, you know, like you said, with Elon, 10 years ago, what qualities do you think young leaders today should cultivate in order to become better in what they're, you know, trying to in the change that they're trying to bring in the world? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. You know, um, you know, sticking with what you're, and it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. Um, stick with what you're passionate about. You know, you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't have a lot of money, but like, I wish, you know, I, I've loved Apple computers since day one, since the time I had it. And I wish I would have invested in what my passion was. Cause if you had a, a some <laughs> Apple stock back then, you know, you'd be a millionaire right now. Um, I, you know, I, I, there is, you know, when I was young, you know, you know, when you try to look back as an adult from the perspective of the eyes that you have now and look back at my, my childhood and my, my parents were Greek and, you know, and they, they struggled, you know, I, you know, socioeconomically, I don't know, maybe we're lower middle class, maybe we're middle class, but I know that money was always at the, at the forefront of a lot of arguments around the house. He's really hard, violent arguments that I, I, you know, struggle with now, cause I, and I, so I, I always thought, well, my, my parents are struggling for, for, for finances. If I only became rich, you know, then my problems would go away. But after I worked for National Geographic, I spent about, you know, 18 years with them. And I, then I worked for fortune magazine for about five. And now I'm, I'm, I'm meeting some of the richest people in the world. You know, at one point I photographed seven out of the 10 richest people in the world, people like, you know, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, Steve Jobs. Um, one of the people I wanted to photograph the most when I was doing a story on the information revolution for National Geographic was this guy by the name of Jim Clark. Jim Clark was uh, in college. He helped send man to the moon. You know, mm -hmm. when John F. Kennedy called to put an American on the moon by the end of the mm -hmm. decade, Jim said, it's not going to happen. So he sped up the, ca the, the computers. He was a college kid working for Boeing where they were manufacturing the engine. He sped it up by 20 fold to make that happen. When he was in Stanford, uh, he created the first 3D graphics engine, the way that you can you know, do gaming in real time and change your designs in real time. That was begun on his chip. The day he quit that business, he started Netscape, the first commercial internet browser, the first way that anybody in the world got onto the internet yep. was through through Netscape. When I met him for Fortune magazine, like later on, he would he couldn't be photographed in geographic, he was too busy, you know, it couldn't be bothered by, you know, <laughs> geographic photographer. But now I was sent <laughs> over, he had he had built this boat and had the world's tallest mask, it was called Hyperion. He had he designed all the computer systems. Seven thousand functions could be run by computers, and I went over the, the day that they're putting the stick, the, the mast on the boat. You know, t world's tallest mast, about two hundred feet. And I'm I'm scared to death of heights. My father died; he was a roofer, and he died from a fall. But I got he, he stood up on the on the top spreader, and I went up the top and then slid down the forest day so I could photograph him with the perspective of the mast. He's smoking a Cohiba and a light rain slicker because it's it's in Amsterdam and it's raining a little bit, and. <laughs> Uh, we went out to eat. Jim and I went out to eat at a restaurant that night in Amsterdam, and he was starting another company called Shutterfly. And uh, he said, "Louis, what you know? I love photography. Would you teach me how to be a good photographer?" And I said, "Jim, I'll teach you how to be a great one if you teach me how to be a billionaire." <laughs> and it's, it began this this uh, this you know wonderful relationship where I would go out and you know basically teach him photography. We'd go out together, and you know he'd pick me up on his plane, and we would take his boat around the world. We, we did a lot of underwater photography. That was really one of our main shared passions. He was a, a, a diver and I was too. And 
we, uh, we were doing underwater photography together, and he was we come back up, and he's like these these cameras for underwater that they have are horrible. And why not, why doesn't Spain make one better? I said, well, they're too expensive. So he made the best underwater camera ever made by like an order of magnitude. He put a medium format camera, a uh, 28 millimeter Rodenstock lens, which is one of the finest medium format lenses ever made and built a housing for it and a special, you know, like I spent a half a million dollars to build this incredible camera that we're still using to this day. Because what he wanted to do is, show, you know, he knew that Jim is one of these people that can look ahead to the future and figure out how to create a business for it. But also he was also passionate about wildlife. He was about being underwater. But best thing he'd ever done, he said, is go underwater. And, you know, it's like an alien universe. You see all these incredible creatures that you, you, you know, you don't see anywhere else. Yeah. And, and it's amazing. And he knew that we were losing it. So he wanted to uh, have like a baseline um, documentation of how reefs were before they got destroyed. We've lost, in the last three years, we've lost about half the, the reefs on the planet because of warming and acidification and a lot of other stresses again you know one of the big stresses for the great barrier reef where a lot of this catastrophe is going on is the runoffs from fertilizers and pesticides from animal production <laughs> so anyway he, he said louis i want to take you to one of the best places i've ever seen this is over in papua new guinea so we you know fly there it takes you know nearly a day his boat's waiting for us we sail for about a day and a half and he drops in on the coordinates, the GPS coordinates of where this great reef is. And he comes back up and he's almost in tears. He says, it's gone. It's destroyed. So it's in, it's in rubble. And we don't know what happened to it, whether it was dynamite fishing or a bleaching event, but it was gone. And every time we would go, we, we went to some spectacular places, the best places on the planet to dive, Raja Ampat, where you can see 300 species of fish in a single dive. If you go to the Caribbean, you're lucky to see 30. You can see 300 there just every day. And we, we, we were in the Galapagos, and uh, we came up, and there was fishermen illegally fishing in a marine sanctuary. And he said mm -hmm. to me, somebody should do something about this. And I said, how about you and I? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, we'll use your money in my eye, and we'll make films. <laughs> so, he, uh, now he, he, so he agreed to do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm in the the fear comes from me. So now I'm changing careers. I'm going from a still photographer to, to be a filmmaker. And I never made a film ever in my life. I had no right to be like thinking I could make a film. And I'm I'm scared to death thinking I could be a you know it could be a sham. And I you know because who am I? I could be wasting his money. I could be wasting my time. I was I was a successful still photographer, one of the more successful in terms of a editorial photographer. But I'm still kind of thrilled and excited and you know feeling like I could be a sham, right? And then we're down in the Caribbean, and he had built, by this time, another boat, world's longest private sailing yacht, Athena, gorgeous boat. And um, I, I, my family's on, on board the boat, Jim's family's on board the boat, and my son is playing on the beach with another kid who happens to be Steven Spielberg's kid. <laughs> Steven Spielberg did Jurassic Park on Jim's computers. You know, that's the Jurassic Park was one of the first. Yeah. yeah, and and I and I actually what I, I did a story on dinosaurs for National Geographic, and I had it, met uh, Spielberg at that point, but he did let me uh, film behind the scenes when they were making the dinosaurs at Jurassic Park. So I had a, a slight connection there, but you know, I'm really the, the father of his son's new friend. <laughs> and so, uh, so Spielberg comes over on the boat, mostly to meet Jim. And, and when I get him alone for a couple seconds, I said, Mr. Spielberg, do you have any advice for a first time filmmaker? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, never make a movie involving boats or animals. <laughs> And you didn't listen. <laughs> well, and I, I'm about how to start. did that work out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I started, you know, with Jim, we started the Oceanic Preservation Society, and our first film was The Cove, which involved a lot of boats and a lot of animals. <laughs> but, you know, to, to your point is, like, you know, we, we were passionate about doing the story. I, and I realize now that, like, how absurd it is for, you know, to do a film like The Cove and have it be that sex, successful. And Because I think right now, knowing what I know about film and like if you know if when you have to like everybody says to me oh Louis if you ever need a you know a secret agent if you need somebody <laughs> to sneak around you know to, to do this work I, you know count me in and whenever I've called people up I said I've got this job and I explained to them they're like oh um you know could I get hurt arrested I go yeah <laughs> 
you know, I got, I got, yeah, I got both. a family. Yeah, I had a family. You know, everybody has a job. Everybody has stuff. And it's like when when the the tire meets the road, you know, a lot of people get scared, and I, it's understandable. But you have right. to have, the, but you have to have the passion. I'm not saying for, for doing dangerous stuff. I mean that sometimes it's just just silly. But I think w- w- with whatever you're doing, you know. Um, Try to figure out what's what's going to make you make you happy. But you know, here's the here's the thing, and I want to bring this around. Like when I was hanging out at you know with with people with too much money at Fortune magazine, you know, I, I just one thing I noticed that with people at the very top is that they they didn't seem to be that happy. You know, mm-hmm. all that money didn't relieve them from the pain that my my mom and dad had. You know, they, they have these other issues. There, there's you know, money is not. Whenever you're se- trying to seek happiness outside of your body, out of, outside of yourself, and you're looking for power, money, sex, uh, you know, the, the title, whatever that stuff. This is all external stuff. The only thing that makes you happy, that gives you joy, that's fulfilling, is when you're hel- helping other people. So with whatever you're doing, you know, that's why. I, I think this work is fulfilling to me because it's not really about me. I, it, it, it gives me a lot of satisfaction, believe mm. me. But it's really that when you're in service to other people, that's what gives you joy. I'm doing a film right now. It's almost done. It's with uh, the Dalai Lama and, and Desmond Tutu, who are mm. best friends. They're two Nobel um, laureates. And um, our team got them together in Dharamsala, and they talked to them for like four and a half days on what it means to be human. So you have two of the greatest spiritual leaders on the planet, Desmond Tutu, for people that don't know, was the the chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You know, down in uh, in South Africa, it was systematic racism where blacks were systematically subjugated to be servants to a very small minority of white people. And after Nelson Mandela and other activists, you know, started to rule the country, they realized that there could be a genocide if you know, with, with white people unless there, there was some sort of reconciliation so Desmond Tutu was put in charge of basically the mandate was if you're a if you're a, a perpetrator if you committed these crimes against black people that if you acknowledged your what you did in front of your victims you had the opportunity to escape jail or retribution and it was a very powerful thing for th- those people in the rest of the world to see that forgiveness was uh, was possible, you know, as a way to go forward. Now, so that's, and then you have the Dalai Lama who had spent, you know, 56 years in exile, you know, where the, the Chinese claiming that Tibet was historically part of China got kicked out of his country. And so you get these two great leaders in the room and talking about what it means to be human. And I learned, I, I wish I had seen this film or read the book that came out of the film uh, years ago because I think it would have helped as a kind of a, a guidepost as people are struggling to figure out, you know, wh- wh- what kind of job do I need that's going to give me the money so I can be happy and get me that big house and that car and this. Because you realize uh, you have these pe- these two guys, like the, the Dalai Lama said, the best thing in the world that ever happened to him was that the Chinese, you know, made him leave the country because... He would. Have, he yeah. said it would have been like a, I would have been in a golden prison. I had much better opportunity. It's like reframing your. He reframed the situations and realized that he could never be talking to the world about compassion and these things. Where I probably wouldn't have been. We wouldn't have been in the room with him unless to be able to talk about this unless that had happened. So, but at the core of it says that this comes from the Dalai Lama. It says everything that you need to do that's going to give you lasting joy comes from helping other people. And by the way, like I mentioned earlier. It, that helps your blood physically. It helps you your immunity. It it increases your telomeres. It does yeah. all these wonderful things to you when you're in service to other people. So whatever you're doing, <laughs> just you know, you you could still you could still be an accountant, and if you're uh-huh. helping other people, then it's going to make you feel you'll you'll never have to work another day in your life because you'll you're, the joy that you have is going to be lasting. And it's also I think they mentioned in the book um, I read it years ago we're hardwired for compassion, right? Like it's our natural tendency to be compassionate and to provide and care about other people before, you know, we think about anything else. So, so that is really hopeful in the sense that, you know, we are hardwired for this. Like it comes naturally to us. Yeah. They do, they, they've done this study with babies where like they have a puppet that's being violent, you know, to another 
puppet. And overwhelmingly, the babies, this is before they can speak, choose the uh, the puppet that's been, you know, victimized. You know, showing mm-hmm. that, you know, we are hardwired, you know, at our, at our, at our base for, for goodness. So when is um, Act Like a Holy Man coming out? Ooh, it's a, a, we just did our, our second screening uh, Wednesday. We'll have a third one in about another month. Um, we'll be done with the film about May, then it's usually about four months later, by, by the end of the year, hopefully. Because I, I wish it was out right now, because um, we're struggling, you know, we're, as, a, as a culture, as we mentioned earlier. It's a, we, we realize that we're all on the same page, and I think we're all realizing what it does mean to, to be human, that we do need these like real physical human connections. And I think, uh, you know, I, I want to, you know, get these films that we're doing out as fast as possible. But you want to keep, a, you know, you need to keep the quality up, too. You know, we test, we, we do a lot of testing of our of our films to make sure that they work. You know, because it's not just me. I, you know, I might be the director on a film, but um, I surround myself with really great people, really good editors, writers, um, producers, you know, people that are really passionate about it. And uh, we realize that. When you work on a project for two or three years, you can get too close to it, so you can't see the forest mm-hmm. or the trees. Mm-hmm. And so you need, you know, like on this last, on Act Like a Holy Man, you know, like people were saying, well, they, they don't, they don't like the Dalai Lama as much as Desmond Tutu, or we didn't give him, you know, enough time. And we we're like, okay, why, why is that? And then we realized that we, you know, we we could just add this little bit to give people a little bit of insight. And then all of a sudden, his score goes up seven percent. <laughs> you know, so you can sort of uh, change the. You know, the way I look at it is like with a film, you have all this content. You know, we uh, the we we have fifteen and a half hours of footage of the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu talking, but we have to get it down to let's say ninety minutes, about as much as people are going to want to watch a documentary. And in that ninety minutes, you have to tell their backstory. You have to you know, give some context. You have other people, the scientists talking about the science of compassion. And so what you have distilled has to be really potent and powerful. And you can, you have a lot of content you can draw from. So now, and then as you're getting closer to finishing it, these test screenings, what you we find is that it's just throughout time. You realize that when people say, Oh, I wish there was more of this. I wish mm-hmm. we had more of that. that. Then you know you're on the right path because it, you know, it makes people curious and you can't fit everything into the, into the film, but you have, you know, our, our responsibility is to sort of make the most powerful, potent 90 minutes that we can based on, you know, our, our ability, you know, the, one of my favorite writers, Mark Twain said, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between the lightning and the lightning bug. Mm. <laughs> and so what we're, tr- and now th- that's just with words. Now you add mm. photographs. I'm a primarily a visual person. Obviously the words are important to me too, but when you start to add the right word with the right image, with the right story at the right time, with the right music, it's it's a powerful powerful mix lightning in a bottle and that's and that's that's why i think you know people can see the you know when people when we did the game changers you know one of the the, the markers of 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 what's trending is google, it's called google trends you know the first 30 days the game changers was on netflix searches for a plant based diet went up 350% worldwide the first 9 days the game changers was on itunes it became uh, the most popular movie a documentary that they've had that was downloaded nine days you know the the films that we do are are watchable they're fun they're entertaining mm-hmm. you know the first rule of filmmaking is be entertaining you know so when you see our documentaries they're not dry like i said first line of the uh, the cove is me saying i just want to say we try to do the story legally you're gonna we're gonna take you on an adventure we're gonna <laughs> the ex, the exposition is going to come along as you're learning about the subject and so it doesn't feel like you know a dry documentary it feels like you know we're, we try to borrow some of the storytelling um mechanisms of um narrative films hollywood films because life the, when you think about it, your best stories are like hollywood films right you know you, it, life is like a hollywood <laughs> film and it's just a matter of picking the right moments so as we're flooded with you know 
factless movies or documentaries actually and all this fake media news do you think you know the movies that you're making and fact-based movies are kind of this antidote i guess to that i would say so yeah i mean I, I'm, I'm banking on it as we, we see the the data points show that it's working you know the when we did racing extinction law you know we reached 30 you know numbers aren't don't tell the whole story but the first day that our film was on television, Racing Extinction, 36 million people saw it in 220 countries and territories the first day. So our, our films are watchable. Oh. They, they are, you know, they're exciting. They, and they make a difference. The uh, Racing Extinction led to laws being implemented in the U.S. to prevent some of the most endangered species from being tracked right, you know, trafficked right here in America. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, we're interested in making a great film. We're make, we're interested in being entertaining, and we're also interested in changing the world. You know, those are, uh, you know, I, I, I try not to be shy about it. So I just if I read the words coming out of my mouth right now, I'd be like, oh my god, he's all full of himself. But it's true. I don't think you can. <laughs> you know, we don't I, we don't make a documentary with the intention of making a movie. We we do it with the intention of making a movement, understanding that we also have to, you know, obey the laws of entertainment. Not that we're, you know, we're making up stuff to put it on the screen, but you have to, you know, we're always thinking like, how can you tell the story in a way that's palpable so that people are getting it viscerally, you know, that you're, you're connecting with them emotionally and intellectually. You know, I think in, in 90 minutes, one of the things that we found out, and it's not in the film, Act Like a Holy Man, but there's this gentleman in the film he's a scientist and the dalai lama uh is 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 actually very scientifically minded for the last 30 years he's been working with scientists in the mind and life institute trying to figure out like uh a scientific validation that the the, the methods that they endorse with um buddhism have their the, i won't say their roots in science but they have scientific results so, so richie davidson a neuro researcher from you know, University of, of Madison, Wisconsin, came to talk with the Dalai Lama. And, and Richie Davidson, his whole life was about, you know, trying to figure out the dysfunctional brain, why people can't deal with, you know, the slings and arrows that life hand them. And um, the, the Dalai Lama said to him, why don't you use the same scientific, you know, measurements that you use to figure out kindness and compassion and what does work mm -hmm. and a, a light bulb went off in richie davidson's eyes and you know he you know hooked up you know monks to ekgs and mris and they inflicts pain on them and does like uh you know uh, like a corollary of uh of people that are are gender matched and age matched and and finds out that these you know that indeed people who meditate are much more resilient you know, they're they're much more in touch with something deeper, so that they can um, bear pain and and not be registered the same way us mortals are. And one of the things that um, I'm trying to remember there was there was something that you triggered that Richie Davidson had said that wasn't in the that wasn't in the film. I'll think of it. I'll think of it. But uh, it, but there's a lot of evidence that. You know what? What what they're learning now is that all the, you know everything that they're that the Dalai Lama has been saying has a there's a there's there's physical ramifications that it actually does change the blood. It does. Oh, here's here's just what it was that uh, that you can in, in just uh, ninety minutes you can change physically, not just mentally, but physically uh, the way the brain operates. And so what this means is that when you hear and I think it was about you, Dina, like when you hear that, okay, plant-based diet, you're going all haywire about like, oh, this is like counterintuitive. It's not what I, I'm thinking that in 90 minutes, that's all it takes to change a person's brain so that they think differently and then therefore act differently. And they can physically show that because they can know where the, uh, you know, where these behaviors reside in the brain and they could do tests, but it only takes 90 minutes to change. How long is a documentary? Yes. 90, Nin 90, 90 minutes. minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and 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 people come out of our films, and you know, you know, I don't know, you know how many times. This, and this is all obviously all anecdotal, but 
you know, they come out of her films and say, oh, that film changed my life, blah, blah, blah. And then you, you hear later that the film changed her life. And, and I, I was always I thinking, well, I always said anecdotally, you know, our films change, you know, rewire the brain the way it thinks. And it's like, I would listen, you know, I was just saying that because I've seen it or heard people say it. And then you have a scientist sort of validate what you've been thinking or your anecdotes. It's it, it sort of... Uh, so I think that that films can change the world because I think if you give me ninety minutes, I can think we can start changing your brain. If you get anybody ninety minutes of of the truth of that of that ten percent, you know, here's the deal: is like, you know, when, when they did those those studies about changing the world, you know, the the science of social change, they did it with the suffragette movement, civil rights movement, Arab Spring, and now Arab Spring, you know, that's that's bouncing back the other way. It's kind of an ebb and flow, right? You know, it's like it's not just a straight line up. It's a, you know, history, history is a, a, a jagged series of ups and downs of, you know, but you know, like Martin Luther King says it, it, you know, that was that the, the, the arc of, of humanity is long, but it bends towards justice. I think that's, you know, and I think films are a way to, for me to level the scales of the inequities, the, 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 the issues that we're facing right now that you know, I think if we're, if we're coming at it and doing uh, expounding truth and it's done in a great package, it is changing your DNA. This is why you refer to the audience as, as uh, minds and seeds. <laughs> yeah. There's a, most Hollywood producers, a lot, I shouldn't say most, a lot of people I've met in the, in the business, they're like, you know, it's like butts and seats, you know, t you're $10 in a box of popcorn. That's back when we were going to theaters, right? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I never looked at the audience like that. They're minds and seats. Every time, you know, you have a chance to change somebody's mind, you have a chance to change the world. And that's, you know, it's all change happens one person at a time. We, I like to think of scale. I'm, I'm, I like to think, okay, we, we need to hit that 10% number. But I also realize that the, at the core of it, it has to be one person at a time. You know, we're, we do these projection events now. If you haven't seen Racing Extinction. Yes, we have. Um, but please see it. It's like we, we do this. Uh, this uh, We knew that it was really difficult to get, you know, that 10% number when you're talking about the world population is, you know, 8 billion people trying to get, you know, 800 million people to see a film is is tough. You know, even on the Discovery Channel, the world's largest network, <laughs> it only has 2.5 billion people, you know, if it was across all the channels. Um, but the projection events that we do, like we, at the end of Racing Extinction, we project endangered species on the Empire State Building. It, something like that had never been done before. I spent four years trying to do it. And the distributor discovery said, oh, it's too much money. And I said, oh, don't worry about the money. I'll find the money to do it. And they said, well, it's on, a, on the weekends, you know, this is in summer. We wanted to project endangered species on the Empire State Building. He said, It'll be in the summertime, all the important people will be at the Hamptons or be over in, <laughs> in Europe. Uh, the press, it gets late. Uh, dark, uh, it gets dark late at night, so the press won't be able to pay overtime. So it'll, even if you could do it, it'll be a non-event. And we had 939 million media views by Thursday. It was the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter uh, for on Facebook wow. worldwide. Oh, wow. And and you know every my son came to the we we had rented a this bar overlooking the Empire State Building. And, you know, the bar was packed. My son comes up and says, Dad, you know, there's people in the streets. And I thought, well, oh, people in the streets waiting to get in. He goes, no, no. We looked over the edge of the building and, the, the, you know, it was like the Easter parade. You know, the, the Fifth Avenue, there's people crowded out into the streets. There was, there was one, we went down to the streets and there was one cab driver. Like, now, try to set this up a little bit. So we were projecting endangered species on the south side of the Empire State Building. And... Fifth Avenue goes from north to south. So cab drivers coming down the street are looking at people looking the opposite direction up, you know, and, and so they, they can't see what's going on, right? So this cab driver stops at the light, you know, and looks, you know, gets out and look, he's, he's got a fare, right? He's got people in the back and he's looking at like a, you know, like a, a, a giant cricket crawling up the side of the Empire State Building or this, you know, or a danger. UFO or something. <laughs> and, and so he gets, he gets entranced by the spectacle, right? And now the people behind him start to honk. <laughs> and so he, so he turns around and gives the, the driver the finger. And then he, with the other, you know, with the middle finger, then he, with his index finger, he points up to the Empire State Building and goes, to, as if to say, look. <laughs> 
then they pulled over and started to, you know, he and the fair with the meter still ticking, start to watch the, the rest of the show. But it was, uh, so we had, you know, an incredible, you know, um, response to that. We thought, well, 900, you know, million people, you know, that's getting close to, you know, uh, over 10% of the population seeing something. And then, um, we thought we couldn't get any more attention to that. And then, uh, then the Pope called. And the Pope wanted to uh, project endangered species on the Vatican during COP 21. Remember that uh, Pope Francis is named after um, St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of animals. Mm. So he wanted, mm-hmm. to, he wanted to, the Pope Francis wanted to, uh, us to project endangered species on the Vatican prior to uh, COP 21, where well, world leaders were in France deciding, you know, referendums on, on climate change. And we had... I think it was like 225,000 people see that live in St. Peter's Square. We had 600 media there and f- about four and a half billion media views in the English language alone. And, you know, it be- and you know that was what, six, years, six, seven, eight years ago now? Jesus, I don't even remember. It couldn't have been that long. 2015. So, so change is possible and we're trying to do it at scale. But, you know, that was probably the first time that a lot of people understood that there was a, a mass extinction event going on. And, you know, one thing I want to point out is we're, we're a small group of people. You know, hmm. my organization, the Oceanic Preservation Society, there's two full-time people working, <laughs> and myself and, you know, our, our COO, Samara Stein, and we have three part-time people. So we're changing the world with just a few people. Not the the films take, you know, literally hundreds of people and we hire those people out to, you know, as needed and we try to move the best ones on to the next film. But, you know, it's it's a, you know, Margaret Mead said never doubt that a, a a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And you look at, you know, even like Elon Musk, he's, you know, he was working I won't say in isolation, but you know, it's Tesla was pretty small, you know, now, now, you know, most valuable car company in the world, richest guy in the world. And again, that's not the meter of success I'm using, but it's just to show that, you know, the passion for a, a truth can really drive and accelerate these social changes that we're talking about. And I would say that the move to electric cars is not a financial motivation for Elon. It's a, it's a social, you know, he realizes that if we want to save the climate, you know, we're going to need to, you know, do this conversion. So I'd say it's part of that whole thing. I talked about joy where, you know, he's really doing it for the bigger picture. And people, I don't think, understand that about him, that he really is at, you know, it might seem like, because if people are measuring wealth, they think, oh, that must be what what motivates him. It's not. My friend Jim Clark, he wasn't motivated by money he just you know there's a lot of motivations and a lot of it was just that he could see an opportunity that that put these tools in the hands of of ordinary people then you have the the power to change the world and that's mm-hmm. what they're interested in you know people see this injustice and they want to correct it we definitely need the projection uh, here in athens too yes oh yeah we've been, we've, we've been talking about doing it for for quite a while we're, we're actually doing another projection event for the united nations on uh, right before the next cop uh, end of october um this is going to be for three days um on the east side of the building this is facing the gantry state park over in queens so we'll be able to get millions of people over there because it's like a big empty park it's beautiful and even if you know COVID isn't completely erased by then you can still do socially distance and get you know tons and tons of people over there yeah. but we're but um the un has asked to do this projection on it's called uh uh, the decade of change because we we know that we need to have about 10 years to, to turn things around so they asked me to be the uh, the director of this project and we have uh, the projections will be three for three days over three nights so like nine hours of programming we'll be talking about you know solutions to climate change solutions to gender inequality and solutions to for poverty so it's a it's a huge opportunity to once again use these projections that we've done and then we'll be using social media and, you know, uh, we'll be crafting ways that we can, you know, basically harness this troop of people that see the, you know, either see it live or see it in social media um, 
to change the world at scale. That's what's you know that's what's really exciting me right now is that we can use a lot of content that were on these that were these films that we're doing and putting it up in the building so that you have like a 38 story billboard sitting proud on the East River with the entire New York skyline behind us. It's going to be an incredible event. In fact, I don't think I've told anybody this yet except no. you guys. So, you know, so you're the first. <laughs> first time. So how can we and the audience support and contribute to your work? Uh, go to opsociety.org and um, look at what we're doing. They can, you know, if they want to want to help, like the, the, the fuel for, for this, for everything we do is, is the financing. So, you know, if there's any high net worth individuals out there or any, listen, every, every nickel that we produce, you know, goes into the, into what we're doing. I, I have not been paid by OPS personally and you know, this is 2014 everything i make I, I make from you know creating the films as a director's fee so it all goes into these projects so opsociety.org so Great. we have a in each episode we have a segment with a couple of standard questions so uh -oh. i would like to ask you <laughs> what does the variable x represent to you i mean the x factor if you want to call it that way What is it? What is the viable X factor? For what you. It? What is it? For you. <laughs> what, 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 uh, Which explain is the variable? Yes. So, so the TEDx Athens, the TED, the yeah. TEDx oh. stands for like the independent, you know, mathematical variable. So, what does that stand for you? Well, I I, I would think it was it's uh, X is the unknown, right? Mm. Yes. You know. I would I would say that you know I, I look at it as a positive thing. It's like the multiplication, you know, uh, the the X factor. You know, they, 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 in, in science, the, the X factor is the it's the un, unknown, and it's also the uh, in, in film, it's what it's what the audience brings to the projection. Like you look at a film, Tina, it'll be different than what Dina does. Yes, and that's yes. they call that the X factor. Yes. So I think it's all whatever you, it is it's a it's a it's a positive thing. So I would look at it as like whatever anybody brings to the equation times a multiple so that's unknown, which is positive because it's all additive, you know, because you're multiplying it. So it's a it's all a very positive, you know, equation for me. Right. And without knowing who our next guest is going to be on this podcast, <laughs> what would you like to ask them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's 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 a tough one. I think I think what, what I'm what I'm always interested in is uh, figure out what you know whether you're at a dinner party or listening to a podcast or you know following a character you you want to you want to know what people's problems are you know like what they struggled to you know to get through to get to where they are and then then next what their what their truth is you know what what they're trying to convince you know. The, the 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 why of it and the how of it is really interesting to me. I think that's, um, you know, when you look at a film or or any work of art, really, I, I think that you you want to see that kind of grace and struggle. And I'm interested in in people and what they're you know what issues they've gone through to get to where they are today. You know, there's uh, it's the the conflict that makes things interesting. Not that it has to be the subject, but I want to know that they struggled. <laughs> you know, because it's helpful to me. Because I think everybody's everybody's struggling. You know, however they w whatever you're doing, I know that there's a struggle. Nobody's ever figured everything out, but. Um, No, oh, I don't. I hope, I hope that uh, answers that question. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to ask uh, Costadino for for your help. If you can ask the question that the previous guest had, without knowing that it was going to be you, <laughs> what was the question of our previous guest? Sure, but before I go into that, I have I can't help myself. I have a pop culture, pop reference question. Did that uh, visit at the set of Jurassic Park that you said with uh, Steven Spielberg inspire your book Hunting Dinosaurs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's a funny story. So I, I, I had done uh, a story for National Geographic on dinosaurs. It was about extinction. And I had... The writer was only there for a few days of each project, and I would... Or each segment of the story you know we're looking for the earliest known dinosaur in the valley of the moon down in uh argentina where and I, i kept a journal and this will be another long, long you know hopefully a, an interesting story but like uh 
as a contract photographer for National Geographic, I own the, the photographs. And I went back to Geographic. I said, listen, I, you know, I've been working on the story for a year and a half. I spent over a million dollars. Let's do, you know, that's great. We have a great article, but let's make a book. Mm-hmm. And they spent about $50,000 on a market survey that said that dinosaurs were declining in popularity. And they said, go do a book yourself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is in 1992, I guess, 93. And... I'm traveling on a plane down to South America to photograph Evo Pitangi, the, the premier plastic surgeon in the world that really popularized plastic surgery. And I'm sitting on a plane next to this guy, and he asked what I do. I told him I'm a photographer for National Geographic. And he said, oh, a friend of mine is doing a, a film on, on dinosaurs. You know, you know, who's your friend? Steven Spielberg. <laughs> you know, And so I was the, the only photographer uh, you know, popular photographer allowed to photograph behind the scenes because Spielberg liked National Geographic. <laughs> and then, um, then you know, I went back to Geographic, and you know, after I went to the Stan Winston studio uh, where they were making the the physical dinosaurs for the film, and saw some bits of the CG, and I said, "Forget your market surveys. This is going to be huge." And again, this is kind of one of those hockey stick kind of moments, right? Where you're looking at the graphs where people think you know, the surveys show that you know. <laughs> Dinosaurs are flat line. There's, uh, there's no future in this. And I said, you know, listen, it's going to be huge. And then so I wrote this book in, in isolation for like a year and a half. And my, I remember my, my wife at the time was going like, oh, you're spending all this money. You should be taking pictures. And I said, no, this is going to be huge. And then um, then there was a story in the New York Times that came out that said, uh, you know, this is going to be a game changer for the movie industry. And then all those publishers that – refused to publish my or you know had passed on that or like hey you know that project you're working on is this still available so now i was now in the enviable position of being a first-time author with a bidding war and um yeah so that jurassic park really did help inspire you know the publication of that book and it's, it's uh yeah, it's called Hunting Dinosaurs. I, I wish I could sell you some, but it's out of print now. <laughs> uh, we'll be okay with the first edition signed yes, by you. Yes, actually, that'll be fine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think well, to, to, so, to answer your question, uh, like what the, uh, I would think that it would be like what motivates you. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I hope I answer that question in spades on this, on this program. So, so the actual question that came from our previous guest, which was Eli Flega, a wellness and fitness entrepreneur, was what do you consider to be your biggest accomplishment achievement? Oh, man, I would say, I mean, do you want me to answer that or do you just want me to know that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, up to, it's up to you. It can be personal. It's can be, it can <laughs> well, be I, think, I, think, I think, you know, it, it, I, to, to be honest, it's, it's every, every single person that gets changed by the films that we've collectively done. It's not about me. It's about the group and, the, the, you know, the collective effort. So anybody that's, that's ever seen our film, that's our biggest accomplishment, to get one person through, whether it's the door of a theater or to see the film, to click on it and, and look at it. That's, that's kind of an achievement because I know that somewhere down – maybe not so deep we're, ch- we're helping to collectively change the dna of that one person and thereby hopefully change in the world even a little bit so that's that's the key you know one person at a time with a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> so speaking about the dna what is your relationship with greece greece and your greek roots we know that you are from sparta and nothing more <laughs> well, my father was from Sparta. Uh, yes. He was born in a little uh, village called Celesia. Um My mother's grandparents were both from a village next to that, like five kilometers away. So um, I wasn't born in Greece, but you know, I've got you know Greek blood runs through me. Um, you know, I still have relatives in Greece. I, you know, one of my biggest embarrassments is that. You know, when I went, to, I took six years of Greek school when I was a kid, but I never really, I, there was only a few Greek families in the town I was born in, in the middle of the country in Iowa. And I, re, mm. I resisted, it was, you know, learning a new language when people weren't speaking it. I, I couldn't, it was, it was a lot of signal to noise. Like, I was like, why am I doing this? It was the, <laughs> the dying language of my, my parents, you know, and it wasn't, I, I resisted and I, and I, I, it's, I feel embarrassed to talk to Greeks that I, I don't really understand the language like I should. I go there, it starts to come back to me. But I love the country. I love the people. Here, when I was growing up, 
forget the language thing. The Greeks were so warm and friendly and loving that I never, I never didn't feel loved if not by my family, but you know, by the community. And I always felt sorry for my American friends because they, I know they didn't have that, <laughs> the warmth that, that we have, you know, that we could easily hug each other, could easily tell each other that we loved each other, that we could, you know, having the, 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 the thinnest of a connection of, of blood could, could bond us. And I think this, you know, you know, the, the secret to that is, I think that to realize that, you know, we can extend that to people that don't have Greek blood. We can extend mm. that sort of love and that feeling to people of other cultures, other faiths. And because there's, you know, what we have in common is way stronger and more beautiful than the things that we don't have in common. You know, that we're all, like you, you were saying, Dina, that we're, you know, we are connected by this common goodness in, in all of us. And if we could harness that, and look at each other, and I, I try to do that. I'm not always successful, but I, I do try to look in at the good of, of everyone. And you know, if you if you start to dig beneath the surface of anybody, you'll find a, you know, somebody there like a, a child that was hurt, mm -hmm. or even he, he, I hate to say it, but even Trump. You know, I, I photographed that that man several times, and I, I see him as a failed human, and you know. He he's pro he's a he's a product of our own culture, you know, of Americanism. He you know he thinks that a gilded building, wealth, you know, a, a beautiful woman that might be only skin deep in in terms of character. I don't know if his wife's, but you know he thinks that that's going to give him stupidly, you know, ignorantly, what's going to make him happy. And uh, and the irony is it probably has made him one of the, the most unhappy people because he's chasing the things that we know aren't going to give him that real joy. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he can, he can surround himself by, by people that, you know, as the Dalai Lama would say, foolish, selfish, you know, cause that's what's foolish. Selfish is when you're doing things for yourself, you can be wise, selfish and still do things for yourself, but know that it's going to be good for other people. And knowing the man, how I know him or knew him or, you know, encountered him, he's, he embodies a, a lot of what I, th I think, you know, people that are enlightened are trying to resist. You know, he's, he, he embodies a, a, a part of our culture that's a bit of a cancer in terms of, um, you know, the awareness that you don't need what he's pursuing to be, be happy. You know, you don't need, you know, wealth, fame the power that you know mm -hmm. comes from that sort of gilded veneer of what they think it means to be a human and i understand like if you live in new york long enough it's about the apartment where you live you know how much wealth you have there's all this sort of uh, codes of you know how people kind of accept another person from their life and you know in that world you, you can make yourself a king but in reality you know it makes you um you know kind of weak that kind of it does because you're not you're not pursuing the kinds of things that are going to give others real joy. So, as you mentioned, uh, Trump. Uh, what about the capital ri uh, riots in DC? What were you on initial thoughts when you wow. saw the unfolding? <laughs> yes, yeah. it's, yeah. it's our last question. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it shows how how close we are to. Decay. And it's also, you know, it's also important to remember that that's a very small minority of people. Mm. You know, most Republicans I know, conservatives, they, they vast majority, they they wouldn't agree with that. You know, that those were that was a, it's an outlier. You know, if I had, I was sort of catching myself here. I was, I was uh, at you know from name dropping, but I was at Elon's house a, a several months back. And he said, you know, there's some catastrophe going on at that time. He says, but you know, he said, Louis, like, there, are, there, are, you know, for every one thing you read in the paper, there's there's millions of good things you'll never you'll never see about you'll never hear about that. Mm. And you know, and it's true. It's like what what the newspapers are is they're condensing the worst of it. And that, listen, the, and not to dis diminish what happened at the Capitol, but um, it's an outlier. You know, that's not who we are. 
That's not what we represent. And one thing that's important is to, to understand is like, you know, democracies still, listen, it's, it's, it's the, the worst form of government except for all the rest. You know, I can't remember who said that, you know, but it wasn't me. Somebody said it just a couple hundred years ago. Um, but, you know, we are, you know, I, th I think that's kind of what, you know, why the Greeks are so proud of their culture is because that we were on the forefront of civilization and trying to take us to the next level, to try to advance our civilization, to try to figure out what's the truth, what's the, you know, what makes us tick, how does this all work? How do you organize a culture, a society, a, you know, a medical industry that's that's based on science and not, you know, dogma? And I think we're still struggling. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna die. We're all gonna die. Still trying to push that, you know, log up a hill. You know, uh, we'll never quite be there. But you know, I think we're we're getting wherever we're going. We're getting towards that arc of justice. You know, one lifetime at a time. And, you know, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, you're never going to change the world completely for, you know, to your, your liking. But I think as long as you're pushing on that log up the hill and with other people that are trying to do it, it, it gives you that sense of joy and satisfaction knowing that the next generation has the opportunity to, to get to the top, whether we get there or not. Yeah. And, okay, before we, we wrap it up, I would like to ask you if there's anything that you would like to uh, mention that we didn't bring up and that we didn't discuss. Maybe for your plans. Like, no. what should we expect from you in the future, maybe? Or Oh, boy. We have a bunch of movies coming out. <laughs> you know, um, it's, I'm, I'm so happy with them. We've got, you know, usually I've done, you know, we've made one film every four to five years. Now we have ten in the works. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we have, we have the, the one I mentioned, you know, Act Like a Holy Man uh, with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, you know, How to Find Joy in a World of Sorrow. Uh, one on female big wave surfers, so females that have, you know, big wave surfers that got pay equity in the sport of big wave surfing. We're doing a film called The Last Place on Earth, because uh, it's, it's the last place where uh, wild tigers, elephants, rhinos, and orangutans are found in the wild, and it's about the activists that are trying to get the palm oil plantations back from the, uh, the corporations that have legally commandeered them. We're doing a film on the future of food called Food 2.0, which is, you know, takes game changers, that film we talked about earlier, to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody wants to, you know, get on the, you know, you know give me an email or, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> go, go to the organization, see if they want to become an executive producer or help us on the projects. You know, we're always looking for, you know, for people to help support, you know, uh, we're not looking for, these are not investments. <laughs> you know, I tell people if they want to make movie uh, money from a movie, you know, you're better off going to Vegas, you know, if, if it's a financial <laughs> play, but if you want to change the world, we're the place to come to. Perfect. That's fantastic. And last question, because I can't help it because I am a meditation instructor as well as a practitioner. Do you meditate? I don't have a, excuse me, I don't have a practice where I do it regularly, but every minute I can, like even before a meal, I'll just do a, a deep breath. Mm. It's helpful, and just, yes. just, just, you know, it's not, it's not a prayer so much as it is just a thought to like, thank God if there is one that, you know, there's, mm -hmm. I can have a meal. I can enjoy the company that I'm with. Even if I'm with myself, I have the, uh, the consciousness to, to be aware that this is an incredible gift, this life that we have, and you know, to use these moments to to try to uh, do good work. It's, it's such a it's such a gift. It's a profound gift. That, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with you all. Uh, hopefully, we're you know we're all collectively inspiring people to that are out there to you know be a better version of themselves because um, yeah. we're all um, we'll get there together. That's what we're striving for yes. as well. And we really, really appreciate your time. So and interesting. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much. For well, your thank time. you. It's about right. two hours. Running yeah. Yes. Fantastic. We, I could go for another two hours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. In Sosalito. In Sosalito. Let, in Sosalito, yeah. Yes. yeah. Let's give that discussion for a future TEDx Athens yes. talk with uh, On with stage. On stage. Yeah. On stage. On <laughs> stage, okay. yes. All right. Fantastic. Thank See you, you very later. much. Cheers. See Bye. You. Thank Cheers. you. This was The Tap, a TEDx Athens podcast powered by iStorm, Apple premium reseller. 
Don't forget to subscribe and get all the latest episodes. Leave us a review. Your opinion is important to us. And share with your friends. Thanks for listening.